Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in a regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Hi, welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. Thanks for joining us again. Today, I've got with me once again by remote video, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, whatever you'll have. I've got Peter Burnett. Peter is an attorney in Leesburg, Virginia. His firm, Burnett & Williams, focuses on personal injury, but that's not why we're talking to Peter today. Today, we're talking to Peter about something that I actually volunteered for, people at my firm volunteered for, and it's just one of the, the greatest examples of just straight philanthropy during this kind of COVID time. And I'm talking about the Ampersand Project. It's essentially a meals project for people during COVID that Peter, I guess, had extra real estate. He's also a local businessman and started this project where he got meals donated by or he paid for himself meals from various restaurants in the area that had excess meals. And then every single day stood outside and delivered them to people through their car windows. Without further ado, Peter, launch into this. Tell me first a little bit about your background, and then let's talk about Ampersand. Well, I, I think probably the first thing I should say, uh, because you probably can't hear it in my voice, is I'm, I'm kind of at the end of my career at this point. I've been practicing law now for, I'm in my 44th year. And I think one of the things that long-term practice does for all of us is that the longer you participate in a community and have a business in a community, the more you appreciate that it's been the community that's made you successful. For me, and I think for lots of other people, instills a, a reciprocal commitment to the community. I've done a number of different things over the years, both on a state level with the bar, and, and I was chairman of the, the uh, Virginia Racing Commission for many years, the supervising horse racing in Virginia, and, and done a, a bunch of interesting different things, and both but charitably and sometimes business projects. A year or more ago, I got interested in these um, little free food pantries, which were an outgrowth of the little free libraries of which there are thousands and thousands all over the United States. And from that came this notion that in, particularly in stressed neighborhoods, having some non-perishable foods in a very convenient cabinet uh, nearby such that someone who had hit the wall and just needed some food right now uh, to get through, particularly for children, could get it out of that cabinet, free of charge, just go and take it and use it. And there, there are some tricks and methods that need to be employed to, to avoid abuse and the like. So I talked to a church in a stressed neighborhood here in Leesburg and, and asked if we could uh, use a corner of their land to set one of these up. And we got it set up and we were chasing volunteers to their stock and restock and, and keep up with it and the like about the time the pandemic hit. And, and when the pandemic hit, it was abundantly clear that a little box of food was a, was a pretty much a token compared to what that neighborhood was feeling. And, and not just that neighborhood, but elsewhere in Leesburg and the county as well. And so, so I started thinking about whether or not some of my stressed restaurant friends might be willing to prepare some lunches if we could find donors to pay them a little bit more than their cost for the food, such that maybe they could keep some of the very people we were serving employed a little bit longer, whether it be on the kitchen line or a dishwasher or whatever it is, and keep the restaurant open and just try and keep things going and, and have the broader community through their donations shoulder this burden that, that was the unfortunate circumstances of our minimum wage folks and, and, and others in the community that uh, just were deeply impacted by COVID. And so the first uh, donor in a fairly big way was my firm. Uh, and I happened to own a vacant property on Market Street across from McDonald's that had 
had been a tasty freeze way back when, and thereafter it had been a it had been a McLean bank for a while, and it had a drive through window in it. And I thought, oh, that's easy. We just put a ramp out that window, and and uh, people could come through the drive through, and we could have the social distancing, and the and the, the all the meals were prepared in a commercial kitchen and put in uh, in bags, and and could just be sent down that assembly line uh, or that ramp uh, to people, and I think one of the biggest hallmarks of, of project in the early going was how miserably I estimated the need. My thought was if we were going to be in the range of, uh, oh, I, you know, 50, 60 lunches a day, I thought would really do the trick. And uh, I will tell you that uh, the first day was April 16th of 2020. And the uh, first day, it took us two hours to get 25 meals out. The second day, it took one hour to get 50 meals out. And the third day, we went past 100 meals in under half an hour. And we never looked back. And we have averaged for months now, oh, right around 300 meals a day. And then, if we, you know, if you, you don't do that for very long before you kind of get to know the folks that are coming through and get to know what their needs are. They ask questions and, uh, like, you know, gee, do you all have any diapers? So uh, we added diapers to the list, and then we added pet food to the list. You added flowers. The whole idea of handing each person a flower, and that. So I volunteered very briefly a couple of times, but it it just moved me, Peter, to see the people crying and to talk to some of the people that came through. Not just people you would think people working in kitchens, but I met an airline pilot who was out of work and didn't have enough money, literally, for food. Just just the, the range and scope of people you don't think about that were affected by this pandemic. And you've been doing this now for what, almost a year. I mean, 365 days come the middle of April, you've been providing hundreds of meals a day to people who need them. Who has jumped in with this? How is it? I think this is a great model. I, I mean, I love, I've told you this, how amazing it is. You know, it's private charity at the end of the day, and the government couldn't put something together like this at the cost efficiency you have. That's the, you know, economist in me talking. But how have you done this? Who's jumped in to help you with this? That's another piece of this that's, uh, where I completely misjudged the uh, various parameters of how it would work. And that is, I had no idea that we would get the level of financial support we did from the community. And I had no idea that so many good folks would jump in and volunteer, as you did, and, and as others have, both economically and with their time hours to come and put in two hours. One of the neat things about this is that some restaurants drop off food, some restaurants we pick it up from them. But basically, you know, the work starts about 10.30 in the morning, and by 11.30, all the meals are ready to go and set up, and the volunteers are there, and the diapers are set up, and the flowers are set up. Uh, and there's a line down the street of people ready to go, but by 1230, quarter of one, it's all been distributed and we close up and everybody goes home. So you get a, a certain level of intensity and a sense of teamwork and, right. and do it one day and you're done. Now, we've given out over half a million diapers. Uh, we're now closing in on 90,000 meals that we've given out. And I think that uh, the volunteering piece has come from individual citizens that have heard about us. We've got uh, some terrific high school students. We've got some folks from various churches that come on a regular basis. And I'm very proud to say, and you're part of this, is that the legal community has been an enormous contributor, both in terms of, of volunteer time, uh, but also in a big way economically. The Loudon Bar Association, the Loudon Bar Foundation, which I started many years ago, individual attorneys have written some pretty healthy checks and they've done it on multiple occasions. This undertaking right now, we've spent a little over $400,000 in the last 11 wow. months doing this. $400,000 for 90,000 meals, half a million diapers and all of the time and logistics, no government agency could do that. So what, I, what I'm really, this is a business podcast for the most part. Most of our listeners are lawyers, or small business owners, or big business owners, or corporate counsel. But here's, here's what I, I'm really excited about and interested in what you did. The factors, the things that made this work, is this worked, and it's working, and you created something out of nothing. And to me, 
and, and stop me where I'm wrong. One, I think you as the driving force, having a really prominent figure in the local community, and in this case, the bar responded because it's you. Let's not, you know, say that, you know, a first year attorney who just hung up a shingle last year would have been able to mobilize the same amount of in interest. I mean, I think the cause is important, but you did a lot of that. I think it's a big part of it. And two, you have a highly, highly visible location. So anybody who's involved, they know about it. They see the results. You post how many meals have been served as a practical matter. So people are like, wow, I see my few dollars that I'm spending directly going into the people's mouths, like directly doing something good for the community, serving a need. It's highly visible. And I think the third thing you did is you pulled in more than just your circle of friends. I mean, you pulled in students and you, every hour, I believe, and tell me if this is wrong, nobody paid for anybody to be there. Every single hour is a volunteer hour and all the money went to food and there's no administrative fees or anything like that. So you've got this kind of like perfect storm of circumstances. So now that I've babbled about what I've observed, what, what could you say if we could boil it down to like the three or four things that somebody who wanted to do this to replicate this in their community, what would they do to replicate this? Well, I'm sorry to say that probably the most motivational piece of all of this uh, hopefully will not occur, uh, but COVID and, and its devastating impact to people. Right. And, uh, to me, and I don't think I'm different from anybody else on this, thinking about a child not getting fed is highly motivational. Highly motivational. I, you know, some individual overeats and doesn't eat in a healthy fashion and wastes their money on other things and could be doing it better. Yeah, you feel poorly that they're not getting everything they need, but they're an adult. They know life is tough. They got to make choices in life, but the kid doesn't have those that control, doesn't have that alternative. So I think people are very motivated about putting food in the mouths of others and their children, number one. Let me ask you about that question. So that's a good number one. So motivated by feeding children, I love that. So you see those commercials with Sally Fields and you know the people who are children who are hungry in Africa and there are flies on them and it's horrible, but that doesn't quite touch people the same way it does when it's a child who's blocks away or in the county or in their city or in their community. How do you make that connection to the people who are giving you their time and money so that they're, it's not this removed, hey, for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can feed a child in Africa. No, hey, this is a child on your block. People are starving where you live and you're fine. How do you make that? Like, I felt that. I was just going to say, I think you're probably a good example of it. And, and you, in some ways, can testify to it better than I can. And that is, to the extent I can persuade someone to come by and check it out, it's unbelievable. Because when you describe it, you know, it's a lot like Sally Field. You know, it's, it's got a little distance to it. You're not up close and personal. But when you're standing in that line, and you're handing somebody a flower, and that person is a citizen, regular person, and they're going, bless you, and thank you so much for doing this, and I don't know what I'd do without you and all the rest. It's a completely different feeling, experience, motivation, call it what you like, for that volunteer. And... They passed the word and people, and the other thing that I think would, it's a little cuckoo. I thought it would be helpful to tell people, you know, how many meals we were putting out because I thought they'd find it interesting and it might be motivational. And it's unbelievable. That sign out in front that we change every few days as to how many meals and we take pictures of volunteers in front of it uh, on a regular basis. You've been in one or two. People say they drive by just to check out how many it has been. It, they'll say, geez, I went on vacation and it was 74,000 and I came back and it was 78,000. I can't believe that. You know, that, that kind of thing. I think, and knowing and seeing that line of cars, and I've got to point out one thing. We'll get comments from time to time, more frequently than you might think, like, well, I saw some nice cars coming through that line. What are they doing, you know, coming in there getting a meal? And I say, yeah, well, that car belongs, one of the cars you saw probably belonged to an airline pilot that uh, used to have a job. And it was the fact that he had an airline pilot's job that allowed him to buy that car. And he's still got the car, but he hasn't still got the job. And guess what? He's also still got the payment book. And if he wants to keep driving the car, he's got to keep up with the payments with whatever savings he's got and the like. And unfortunately, the discretionary funding that he has in his home budget includes food. And, you know, turning the thermostat down and all kinds of other things that, that everybody does to try and save money. And, and so we're trying to fill that gap a little bit. The 
other, and the one other thing is we put a donation box right next to the ramp. And it's interesting. You will see some people will come through there who are poor as church might. You're scared that their car is not even going to keep running for them going through there. It's clear that they're just poor as poor can be. And they get a couple of meals and they put a dollar in that box. Then you get other people come rolling through there in their nice new SUV. Maybe it's a Mercedes, maybe it's something else. And they don't get any food, but they slide $100. Or we had one person slide a $500 check into that box. And so we encourage that cross uh, connection between rich and poor. We're all in this together. And I think that's motivational as well. And I love that. Again, I think two things you just said there. One is getting people to connect with the idea that children are going hungry locally. A lot of that has to do with visibility. It was you, the personality, somebody prominent in the business community, driving people to show up. And the fact that people drive, you're literally on Main Street. You've got a location. So I think it's important to say that what is part of the success, for better or worse, Peter, is the fact that that old um, McLean Bank or that old uh, Tasty Freeze is literally the main drag, Route 7, Northern Virginia, that every single human being who comes through Loudoun County probably drives by. And so that has added so much. Uh, I think the, the effort where you put how many meals are out there and who the sponsors are, that makes people excited to be involved, too. And I, you know, I, I'd love to say that everybody does everything purely out of the goodness of their heart, but there's some value to that too, that they can see the goodness that they're doing. It sounds like if somebody wanted to do something like this in their community, they would need a highly visible location and a Peter Burnett. And, uh, and then they need, and the first thing you said, it sounds like the third thing they would need is some set of circumstances like COVID where people connect right away with the cause. They understand what's driving it. It's not this ephemeral idea that there's not enough food in Africa. And I keep using that just because we're familiar with it, not because I'm for or against it. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to draw, figure out here. Because I, I love this and I hope that somebody listens to this podcast and then calls you, Peter, and says, hey, Peter, you did this in Leesburg, Virginia. How can I do this in Sacramento, California or Dallas, Texas or something like that? Because I, I just think it's amazing. Well, I would certainly welcome the call. And, and you touched on it earlier, too. The, the one other component I would add to it is, I think given the amount of bombardment for good causes that we get on TV, in some ways it has a somewhat numbing effect. And then the other question is, geez, you know, how much money is being spent on overhead for, for actually the ad that I'm watching? You know, they, all right. these donations that come in, there's a high percentage of money that's going to the promotion mm -hmm. and all the rest in this little tiny microcosm that, that my project is, you've identified a couple of things. One is, you know, as an attorney and then doing trial work and, and being a personal injury attorney, there is more than a little bit of advocacy that I've learned over the course of decades. Uh, and I, because we're a small town, I, you know, I know a few people in the newspaper business and, and media, and I call them up. Hey, we've got a good story for you. What do you think? Well, they're human beings too, and they're impacted by it. And they know people want to read about it. And so they put the story out there. Folks hear about it and they check in. And then we've got some, maybe evangelist isn't exactly the right word, but we, we've got some people that say, well, I, you know, let me help by doing this. I've got a couple of friends that can afford to support a thing like this. And if they knew about it and they know how it's working and what it's doing for their local community, they will. And I've, right. had, I've had some five and ten thousand dollar checks come from places that completely shocked me. I had no idea, didn't know why. And here it came. That's fine by me. So you said a small town. I mean, to be fair to most of America, 350,000 people or so in Loudoun County, maybe a little bit more. And Leesburg's over 50,000 people. So it's a pretty big town. So you've done a pretty big thing here. I, you know, you've wrangled some pretty significant resources. So I just, I, again, for everybody in this community, in, in the Loudoun County community, where one of our firm's offices is, uh, thank you for that. And thanks for coming on today, Peter. If there's, is there anything else that you think you would say to our listeners about doing something like this themselves or any like piece of wisdom you can say looking back over almost a year and you know, 90,000 meals and half a million diapers where you're like, gosh, I wish I knew you know, day one what I know now. I think it's, it, it has uh, affirmed an outlook that has become more and more apparent and, and motivational for me 
over the years, and that is, it's almost a, a little bit of a contradiction. Practicing kindness is its own reward. It feels almost as good to the person that's doing it as the person that's receiving it. And from a business perspective, you know, it's just, I don't know, you call it karma, call it whatever you want, but when you spend your time thinking about other people, whether you're thinking about your, your customer, whether you're thinking about your neighbor, whether you're thinking about a relative or your kids, we think less about ourselves and more about other people, the better we feel about ourselves and the, and the better society. Yeah. And, and I just think, check it out. You, it, it's almost addictive. And, uh, I, I testify to that. I, I, I felt handing somebody a meal was so much more satisfying than handing somebody a check, like yep. than handing you a check to give to somebody to buy a meal. Like, like actually being there and handing them meals or handing, I did the flowers one day. I just, well, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm a hard hearted, hard hearted guy maybe, but I, I, it moved me. So we did with your firm kind of a specialty project where we had a, uh, an angel tree type of Christmas giving and your terrific employee, Amy, uh, Amy <laughs> worked her tail off on this thing. And we ended up having custom selected gifts that children had asked their parents for, and their parents had no way to be able to buy them or afford them. And we coupled them up with folks who could afford them and liked providing them and gave them to the families, uh, to the parents with wrapping paper and everything else. And I mean, in some cases it was bicycles and, and uh, yeah. uh, various kinds of big presents and took care of over 400 kids. And, and you yeah. talk about feeling good. Those parents were just in tears getting those things and having a real Christmas with their kids in a year when a lot of folks went without. So it's very sad. Yeah, satisfying. we'll do it again this year, Peter. Yeah. There you go. It'd be great. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. That, that was great. So, well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I think, I think everything you do is, is fantastic here. And, uh, you know, as you transition into less law and more community stuff, I think it's good for our community. And so thank you. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.